sing this song together. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship. darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you.
just sit at your feet and worship you. You are so good. We are in awe of you, Lord. We are in awe of who you are. We serve a living God. We serve the most wonderful God. Sing it about it now. Here we go. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of
Ted Haggard here from St. James Church in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And of course, we're pastoring the storehouse now, which is uh, the house church ministry of St. James Church here in Colorado Springs. And we're excited about the house church. I'll tell you what, my wife and I are absolutely loving this. If you'd like to join us here in the Colorado Springs area, you'd be welcome. Uh, It's just so, so delightful. So tomorrow morning is the first Sunday in June. And uh, so we're going to be meeting in our backyard. And so right after this taping, I'm taping on Saturday night because we've been setting up things 
in uh, our backyard, there's a little fire pit area. And uh, you can see some of the chairs in the background there. And uh, this is where I'm going to be speaking to you from, from right here with our little table. And there's the back of our house. There's where we're, we have Cokes. We don't have beer in there. And uh, and then over there's the the uh, uh, grill. And uh, so so next so tomorrow we'll be meeting in our backyard at 10 o'clock and we'll have our little service back here. It's just so awesome. It's all friends. It's all nice. Nobody's a number and and everybody's kids. We know everybody's kids and the kids know us. I'm I'm old enough to be their grandpa. And then there's middle aged people and all these different ones. And it's just it's a whole different world. So so the, from the time I was 28 until the time I was 50, we built a mega church, 14,000 people and 1,100 small groups, 150 employees, beautiful campus, great big 45 acre campus. And it was, it was just great. Then from the time I was about 50, 54, 55, something like that, until I was 65, we did St. James Church, which was an average sized church here in America. 300 people attended or so. And uh, of course, they, they weren't all there at the same time. Average attendance there for a while, 200 people. And then uh, it fluctuated, fluctuated as time went by. Then COVID hit, of course, and all that. Now we're doing the house church. I'm 65, and we'll probably do this the rest of our lives. And it's just awesome. Okay, so so here's here's the way it touches me here. And uh, today we're going to talk a little bit out of Mark 1. And it says, um, beginning in Mark 1, the New Living Translation, this is the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. It began just as the prophet Isaiah had written. He said, look, I'm sending a messenger ahead of you, and he will prepare your way. And so it's talking about John the Baptist being the messenger to prepare the way. He is a voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord's coming, clear the road for him. Now, that's our calling. We're to go into, go into all the world and preach the gospel. We're to make disciples. We're to baptize people in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So our calling is to prepare the hearts of people for the coming of the Lord. So <clears throat> this has been great because uh, Gail and I are retired. We're fine. Everything is fine. But I wanted to do outreach. All right. And I didn't know how to do outreach and uh, or how to get access to people that wanted to talk. So I started driving for Lyft for fun. Lyft is... Uber is kind of the founder of the whole ride sharing thing. And then, and then Lyft has come along and kind of improved on it. It's really good to work for them. They're a great company. And so anyway, anyway, I drive for Lyft in order to get exposure to people here in Colorado Springs. And it is, it's been the best personal ministry I've had with people since I was in high school and college. And because it's one-on-one -on -one. when we built a new life. I was the pastor kind of at the staff and the small group leaders, but, but not with average people in, in all the different walks of life. And, um, and then St. James church was just nothing but a pleasure. It was just pure delight, lots of good friends and everything like that. And then now we've got St. Now we've got uh, the storehouse, which is a ministry of St. James church. And so anyway, I had these printed up. These are little, um, ancient sayings and what they are are their proverbs but i randomly uh organized them so there's no numbers and there's no way for a person to know that there are proverbs from the bible and we designed it for people that uh don't wouldn't necessarily want to listen to anything christian or jewish or anything so it says ancient sayings from around the world now understand i'm talking to you about preparing the way for the lord in the hearts of people all right. That is our responsibility. So here's what I say here. I said, well, researching ancient civilizations and what Christian hasn't done that. OK, while researching ancient civilizations, scholars have discovered many ancient sayings that were embraced by those civilizations to assist people in discovering wisdom. I have compiled a few of them here. All right. Then it says, if you decide to read this, see in this awesome Okay, if you decide to read these, think about them and maybe even discuss them with your family members and friends. You might find more wisdom and thus greater peace, success, and contentment. See, wisdom is not godliness necessarily. It's wise to be godly, but wisdom is not godliness. See, it's it's um, it wisdom is when you put to, can put together the elements, personalities, culture. Uh, resources, uh, 
all the different elements to reach a desired success or a desired goal. All right. And so, so here it says you can find greater peace, success, and contentment. This is my gift to you. Then it just says, from Ted, your Lyft driver. <laughs> and so they don't have my last name. I don't have theirs. And of course, if we if we talk and hit it off, I invite them to go ATVing with me. Or or sometimes I'll I'll tell them about the house and and uh, tell them what we're doing here and and invite them to come here and do this. But see, but see that that's a typical page right there. See, it's just bullet points. It's not numbers. And and if it ever says the king, then I put in the government because you know we we hopefully we don't have a king except King Jesus unless you're. Uh, an old fashioned uh, monarchist and you still think Queen Elizabeth is in charge of your life. So, so anyway, um, uh, and here's, here's why I'm doing it. Okay. Th this is a book written by one of the Scott, one of the researchers. And, and here's what he says. He says, he, he quotes the King James, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. That's out of John 14. And then it says, Christianity is at a crossroads. The body of Christ is facing game-changing times. America, founded on Judeo-Christian principles, is on the verge of becoming a post-Christian nation. And I actually think it's there. Our religious institutions, I'm sorry, our uh, educational institutions are there. Our governmental institutions are there. Our uh, Many of our churches are there. It's kind of a post-Christian uh, uh, world and even m the vast majority of Jewish people in America are secular, and and so so anyway, I, I think culturally we're there when when some of our greatest efforts are there are there to protect uh, non Christian activities and ungodly activities. It says uh, America, founded on uh, Judeo Christian principles, is on the verge of becoming a post Christian nation. God is being pushed out of every aspect of society, and that's certainly true. I mean, try to. Uh, try to bring up a godly uh, discussion of God in a typical classroom nowadays, or even on an army base, or in uh, in the upper echelons of of the Pentagon, or, or things like that. Okay, non-believers are throwing everything they have into a campaign to discredit and destroy organized religion. I don't know if you watch like Law and Order or any of those types of shows, but boy, when they portray a Christian, it is very sel seldom authentic. Um, it's very often demeaning or judgmental or or um, or really low IQ type discussions coming from the Christians or the religious folks. Satan is orchestrating an attack that will jeopardize the very fabric of modern Christian lives. And inside the church, believers are being driven out by legislative doctrines and power grabbing politics. So many of our churches think Americanism is Christianity. Or an Americanism is wonderful. I'm a conservative Republican and things like that. But and I love America and Americanism. And I believe we ought to teach prosperity, which includes free market capitalism and things like that. But boy, oh, boy, go to a modern university campus and try to explain the virtues of free market capitalism and watch what happens there. Many worshipers are on the verge of leaving after years of dedicated service. One of the largest churches in Colorado Springs, New Life, my old church, the church we build is still the largest, but one of the other largest ones here in town, um, they have a Dunners group and it's, it's, it's uh, uh, people 45 and over that are done with the church and they're trying to attract them back and they call them the Dunners class. We're done. All right. And here it says, Longtime members are so dissatisfied that abandoning the Christian community entirely appears to be the only option. It's because they don't want to be a number. They don't want the greeter to be the only person that says hello to them on a Sunday morning. Explain. I and let me explain to you. That's why we're doing the house church. See, we're doing the house church because we want the young people, in, in, the young people in our group, to uh, to know the older people and the middle aged people and the babies. And we want we want it to be intergenerational. Young adults have er earned the title of the unchristian generation. Many are shunning religion despite a lifetime of family engagement in church. Aging demographics are putting some congregations at risk of extinction. Some researchers are saying that this is a hard thing to measure. So there's a lot of debate about it. But 20 percent of the churches in America have disappeared since the beginning of the pandemic. And they say it's hard to measure because um, 
because lots of the churches, there's no way to measure a church that's disappearing unless you're part of a denomination or some network of churches or whatever. But if you have a typical little Methodist church sitting in a cornfield in Ohio and they have a dozen people in it and it's disappeared now, there would be no record of that unless it's a Methodist church. But if it's an independent church, there's no record. Okay, my generation, when I was in high school, 80% of Americans believed the Bible is the word of God. Jesus is the son of God, and you must be born again. That's the definition of an evangelical. Today, they say 4% believe that. And so, so that's a whole different world. Millions of Christians in the United States are not even attending church. And I see that all the time. When I pick up people in my, in my car to take them wherever they need to go, very often they'll say they're Christian. And then I'll say, what church do you go to? And they'll say, oh, I don't believe in organized religion. Or they'll say, oh, I love the Lord Jesus with all my heart. And I'll say, what do you think of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? And they'll say, what? And so, so, so anyway, some have left the church and vowed never to return after bad experiences. Many followers have been on the sidelines for years waiting for the right opportunity to re-engage. Others never fully committed to Christ. And so, so anyway, we're in a... When a we're in a very interesting situation, countless persons are searching for a new and exciting way to serve God, but have not found the right connection. Religion and misguided doctrines have stood in the way of believers finding God's purpose for their life. The unlimited potential represented by disconnected Christians is outstanding. And so so what we want to do is build a network of house churches. And our first one is ours that we're starting from St. James Church. And uh, and we'll t- we'll take a year or two to figure out how to do it. And then we want to we want to expand and, and have a network of house churches. But see, the whole purpose is prepare the way for the Lord in the heart of people. And so so that's that's what I have always been about. Only we've used different formats in different generations as we've gone through the years. And now we're using this one. So anyway, okay. Hey, that's enough today. Uh, I think you've got that big idea and it's always great talking to you. Thank you so much for tuning in and I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.